Okay. Uh, welcome back. Thank you very much. <coughs> so we are about to start uh, after break session. Now it is a member states presentation. Key risk transfer and micro insurance performance in the EGAD region. Uh, we will have a member states presentation. We will start with uh, Djibouti. Uh, I, yeah. Risk transfer and micro insurance in Djibouti. Please, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We, are, we, we arrived late yesterday night. We were at, at the hotel at 4.30. That's what, that's what we were late today. <laughs> okay, so I'm going uh, to present risk transfer and micro insurance in Djibouti. Uh, I'm from, my name is Ibrahim Jama from Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock. And uh, here are my co colleagues, Warsama Osman Ahmed, from Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, and Mohammed Safi for the Ministry of Finance. Finance. Yeah, thanks. So here is the definition of uh, risk transfer. I want to be brief, so. In Djibouti, uh, there is a conventional and Islamic insurance exists and are regulated by two laws and uh, also decrease. Currently, a four insurance company operate in Djibouti market for several pro uh, products, uh, automotive, maritime, fires, houses, and travel. Agriculture insurance and livestock insurance are not practiced by insurance company in Djibouti because of the small market and because of also the lack of data in Djibouti. Uh, Djibouti set up universal health insurance in 2014, which constitutes prevention and social protection against the risks of illness. The basal medical coverage, coverage for the entire population living in the Republic of the Djibouti. This uh, universal health insurance system is developed around two, two le uh, le levels. Compulsory health insurance, for the active self segment of the population, and the other, it is a social health assistance program intended for the poor people. So the objective is to include uh, uh, poor people. Uh, Djibouti also signed a contract in 2022 with the agency ARC, you well know that, Africa risk capacity to protect itself against drought and floods over a period of five years. So it's very, it's very recent, it's very, it's very new. Uh, there are also financial cooperatives in Djibouti called the CPEC. It's for saving and, and, and credit funds made up of a group of natural persons based on, on the principles of union, solidarity and mutual assistance and whose main purpose is the exercise of fi financial activities for the benefit of its members. Collection of savings, granting of credit, transfer of funds, exchange, micro-insurance, and so on. So formal micro-insurance does not exist in Djibouti, but it would be inter very interesting uh, to, implement, to, to implement it. It will be also very important to access agricultural livestock insurance, such as index-based livestock insurance. For way forward, uh, uh, we have to facilitate index, index insurance for the agro-pastoral sector for insurers. A, feasi a feasibility study is also very necessary in Djibouti. 
micro insurance for low income activities in all sectors is also very recommended. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Okay, uh, next presentation is uh, Ethiopia. Uh, please come to the floor. Oh, okay, Joel. Good morning again. I'm Malkacho from Ethiopia. Uh, I'll be presenting some micro insurance practice that has been implemented in Ethiopia. And then there's the challenges, opportunities, and some recommendations at the end. So uh, to give you some background about Ethiopian agriculture, um, the country is about 36% of the GDP, employs at, at about 70% of the level force, contributes around 90% of the export earnings. That however, uh, this is dominated by 50 million smaller farmers producing more than 90% of the national agricultural uh, production, which is uh, actually the rain fed. Um, the agriculture sector uh, in Ethiopia has been uh, beset by natural disasters, of course, which is drought, is the most frequent and then the severe peril the, in the country. Yeah, according to NDP, 2011 uh, estimation between 2000 and 2007, the combined really direct cost of drought and uh, the flood fluctuated between uh, 170 million USD to uh, 2.5 billion USD. Um, uh, the value of largest recurrent disaster loss amounts to about 4% of the crop related agriculture and 7.3% of livestock uh, related GDP in the country. So in response to this, um, there are several micro insurance interventions that are uh, being implemented in the country. Then I'll be uh, taking you uh, through some, some, some uh, products. Uh, so uh, the micro insurance products in the country, uh, crop insurance, with this crop insurance, we do have uh, vegetation index crop insurance that is being implemented uh, in, in Oromia and uh, uh, some parts of SNPR, Southern Nations, National SNP Press Region, with the financial assistance obtained from uh, JICA and the Insure Resilience Solution Fund through KFW. And also, we do have multiple crop insurance, which is a traditional uh, kind of micro insurance, which is uh, being implemented across the nation. And uh, the distribution channels are uh, microfinance institutions, primary cooperatives, and the Rosacos. So a real index insurance that has been implemented in Amara region and then the Oromia too by uh, LIFT program by, by the fund obtained from UK aid. And also we do have weather index crop insurance that has been uh, first implemented and in the Tigray region uh, throughout the Sarita project, Horn of Africa risk transfer and adoption. And then we, we brought the experience to uh, Amara region and it has been implemented since uh, 2009. So uh, we do have also uh, index-based livestock insurance and the multiple crop insurance. Uh, index livestock insurance has been implemented in Borana in 2011 and uh, still running commercially. And apart from the commercial running micro insurance product, we do have also uh, the drive project and then it was implemented in 2023 and the take-up rate was quite high because it has some, uh, some incentives and 90% um, uh, of the premium is subsidized by the drive project. Um, apart from this, uh, we have also satellite index insurance for the pastoralists in Ethiopia. It was implemented in Somali region by WFP and uh, the commercial underwriters were four insurance companies, uh, namely Oremia Insurance, Niala Insurance, Ethiopian Insurance Corporation, and African Insurance. 
Uh, so the multiple cr- the life stock insurance, the last one is life stock insurance for you, uh, for the missed uh, type. So um, that is uh, suitable for dairy and the fattening uh, cows and uh, is being uh, sold across uh, the nation. Um, coming to the status, uh, during the 2022-23 fiscal year uh, with crop insurance, uh, about 25,000 uh, smaller farmers have been uh, covered. Uh, 10 million uh, premium has been generated and we have insured uh, 55 million and the claims paid out was 2.5 million. With livestock insurance, um, the figure uh, seems a bit high uh, due to this dry project I mentioned earlier. And um, our more than 62,000 uh, uh, pastoral assets have been uh, covered. 380 million premium was collected, and then the sum insured was 2 billion Ethiopian birch. So the claims paid was 46 million. Uh, this is the claim paid for the index based livestock insurance for one region. And uh, the, the, the premium collector was 5 million, and against five, 5 million against 46 million. We can, we can imagine that how much the index based livestock insurance is loss making, and then the uh, insurance company has been, you know, uh, the surging corporate social responsibility, apart from earning the, the, the co- I mean, the, the uh, profit. Um, the challenges, uh, we've been mentioning this challenge actually several times, and the lack of uh, arquette intermediary, both in terms of quality and then the readiness. Uh, we're liking this, uh, uh, and uh, we've been distributing this row uh, Primary cooperatives, the Rusakos, do not have any the, any, any uh, know how on how to do it, and uh, we've been uh, conducting different awareness creation campaigns several times, and uh, still that is lacking. Uh, before the dry the dry project uh, came on, uh, there was no premium subsidy uh, apart from WFE program that is being implemented in Hamara region and the SIP program. Uh, all the premiums were. Uh, being paid by, by, by the pastoralists and uh, farmers themselves. Uh, limited financial literacy has uh, created a trust problem actually among the community and <coughs> we need to train them again and again. We need to create awareness again and again so that, so that they can, they can uh, know uh, really insurance is mean risk and to assist them during the critical drought conditions. Lack of private pa- uh, public partnership. But, uh, in fact, there is some uh, move actually to come together, discuss, and then and, and work together, actually. Uh, some move has been started. We've been discussing with Minister of Agriculture. Um, uh, at, at lower uh, zonal level, uh, the Agriculture Office and the Cooperative Promotion Bureau uh, have started to, to, to uh, uh, assist uh, insurance companies and the private and institutions. Still, uh, there is no formal private uh, uh, public partnership and uh, still we are looking for that and our Minister of Agriculture representatives are here and uh, they can do uh, something best. Um, there is knowledge gap among different stakeholders uh, like like uh, the Rusakos, uh, primary cooperatives and the microfinance institutions who are distributing the products. And also of appetite from reinsurance side. Because of the nature of the business, um, uh, it has been you know, loss making for the last uh, more than 12 years, and uh, uh, reinsurance companies are hesitating to cover, to give the reinsurance. You know, without having appropriate uh, reinsurance, um, it is quite difficult for the insurers actually to, to go to that business too. Um, the last one is uh, absence of clear strategy from donor side. By the time the, the project phased out, everything stops there. So uh, there has to be some clear strategy uh, on how to sustain after after the project ends. Uh, policies and regulations. Uh, with regard to policy, national agricultural policy, you don't have that one, actually. We have drafted uh, some uh, five or five or four, four pages as part of national financial inclusion. And that is still pending at draft, and uh, no uh, national agricultural insurance policy enacted. Uh, regulation, uh, National Bank of Ethiopia has enacted uh, a directive called licensing, license renewal, and the product approval for micro insurance providers, uh, the directive number SMIB 30 2020. Uh, license learned. Uh, 
several lessons has been learned actually from the last um, uh, more than a decade journey. Uh, the, the first one is there has uh, to be national agricultural insurance policy to scale the product. Uh, the second one is there has to be some premium subsidy. Uh, we, we, don't we don't need to provide uh, premium subsidy across the board. It has to be, to be smart, it has to be you know, uh, provided for the needy family. You know, providing across the board would uh, hamper sustainability and the commercial, commercial, commercial uh, the aspect of it. So uh, from the, uh, for donor-led programs and interventions, there has to be a clear strategy, I hope. The government could uh, coordinate these and evaluate the, the uh, exit strategy of the donors whenever they come and uh, intend to implement any, any micro insurance practice. Um, and then we need public private partnership um, uh, to, to, to take the agenda of micro insurance to the next higher level. This is also one of the lessons learned. Uh, whenever there is assistance between the, from the government and the uh, public institutions, the take-up rate um, uh, has been you know, increasing and then that was good. Uh, in some cases, when the government initiatives you know, be reluctant and uh, are not supporting the programs, you know, the take-up rate is quite low, so we need to uh, have that too. Uh, the way we create awareness uh, can bring a change, so we need to create awareness um, by using different awareness creation, the community mobilization mechanisms. We need to work on that. These are some of the lessons learned and the takeaways. Um, the recommendations, um, uh, the government need to put in place agricultural insurance policy, availing smart premium subsidy, uh, as I've discussed earlier. Um, the government should oversee and uh, govern donors led programs and interventions so as to have a clear um, exit strategy and ensure sustainability as well. So uh, creating public-private uh, public partnership, also the another recommendation. And also that, that, that the last, awareness creation and the community mobilization activities should be streamlined with the government extension workings because the government do have uh, structures down the line and uh, that uh, private and insurance companies have not. So uh, we can easily create awareness using these um, channels and uh, uh, ensure uh, 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 the sustainability of this product is. Thank you for the, your kind attention. Thank you, Mercacho, uh, for the very nice presentation. Uh, so the next uh, speaker is a uh, representative from Kenya. Please come forward. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kenneth Anahinga uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Nairobi, Kenya. I'll be making a presentation, but I'll keep on moving because uh, this one is clearly on crops, but I want to make presentation for two post crops and livestock. Just to uh, hone or to give house for this presentation. All of us know that uh, in Kenya, actually, we are basically an agrarian economy. Our economy is heavily driven by agriculture. It's giving us employment. Uh, we have a lot of raw materials and foreign exchange from, from agriculture. But over the years, we are finding that uh, whereas we are witnessing an increase 
uh, or, or rather a better performance in agriculture, but the sector has been hit highly by natural disasters. And a very good example is the drought that we had in this country from 2008 to 2011, where the country lost about eight, 700 billion in terms of livestock loss and close to 100 billion in terms of crop loss. So that therefore necessitated something to be done because we are used to post such interventions to go and give relief food, to go and give, uh, you know, do, to do restocking. But there was now an awakening among this government that there is need to do ex ante intervention so that uh, before the sector strikes, there is there's a third party who has been brought on board. So a study was commissioned by the World Bank from 2013 to 2015 to try to understand the Kenyan insurance landscape. How, what, who are the players within this ecosystem? What hurdles you know, limit the smallholder farmer from taking insurance as uh, one of the ways of uh, uh, mitigating against risks of um, uh, 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 agricultural shocks? And in 2015, when, when the report was out, then uh, the recommendations were that uh, we come out with um, uh, programs, one targeting crops, another one targeting livestock. And Kenya, actually, two-thirds of it is basically a soil that is in semi-arid. So the recommendation was that um, the semi-arid part of the country, which is the home to 80% of Kenya's livestock, should, be the, should, should enjoy the livestock insurance program. And the 13% part of the country, which is medium high potential, should be the one to, to enjoy the crop insurance program. So the programs have been running since then. And uh, I would just want to uh, just show you a few, a, few, a few flights on the agriculture insurance program, the milestones that we have covered, what have been the challenges, and where are we, and what do we think is the way forward in this agriculture program. Then I will also share with you a bit on the livestock insurance program. My screen has a, a problem. Okay, so uh, that's the crop insurance program. And uh, this program, as I've said earlier, that's the overview, I bring the overview of the program. Uh, what are the key, uh, the framework for implementation? And then I'll be able to, to, to discuss with you what we think is the way forward. Uh, in my introductory remarks, kind of I've already already unto this, that we are actually seeing an increase in the frequency of disasters in the country. Previously, it was five to seven years, but you can predict that each and every year you are going to have a disaster. Because they behave like a pendulum. It swings this, this way, you have, this, you have got drought. It swings this aside, you have got floods. And uh, we, now even, we are not even having, we are seeing pests coming in. For the longest, we did not have locusts in this country. But last year, they came visiting. So we, have, we also have the issue of the, the fall armyworm. So all these things therefore compounded, they actually impact negatively on the smallholder farmer. So and that is the the, 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 of the program. So the program is a risk mitigation in light of the climate change. And the program has been implemented under a public-private partnership model. We have the government, both levels of government, the national government and the county government having distinct roles and responsibilities to be played in the execution of this program. And we have the, 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 the private component, which is made up of the, insure, the insurers, the reinsurers having distinct roles and responsibilities in the execution of the program. In Kenya, insurance is 100% private. There is no public company for insurance. So it, it only makes sense that when you have got like a program, then you do it under PPP so that the government does what, what it, it, it is good at and the private sector do what they're actually good at. 
Uh, we have actually been able to move. We began in three counties, but as of today, we have covered over 40 counties in the country out of the 47 counties in the country. Which are the value chains? The value chains is maize, sorghum, green grams, potatoes, and onions. Uh, this program, we give a subsidy, and uh, my brother from Ethiopia was talking about subsidies. In the study which was uh, commissioned, we, it was found out that one of the limiting factors which uh, prevents smallholder farmers from accessing insurance is the high premiums on offer by the insurance companies. So we began this program at the back of our mind knowing very well that if we were to do it and allow the insurers to come just like that, then we will not be able to achieve objective. So in the program, farmers who grow any of those crops from 0 0.5 to 20 acres, the government pays 50% of the premiums per acre. Over, hand, over 20 acres, you pay 100%. But from 0 0.5 to 20 acres, the government pays 50% of the premiums. So uh, we, we are using the area yield index insurance. Uh, the area yield index insurance where farmers are grouped in an area based on defined uh, parameters. And the single most parameter there is normally yield. Hence the name area yield index insurance. Uh, I don't need to, 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 to get into it. But I want to say that to date, in terms of uh, achievements, we have been able to put 1.6 million farmers on the scheme uh, against a target of uh, 3 million farmers. We are short, but uh, with, the, with what we have done so far, I think it's good. We have been able to get 1.6 million farmers on the scheme. Um, and then uh, we have been able to pay 416 million Kenyan shillings in terms of subsidy, and out of it, we have paid 218 million shillings in terms of compensation to the farmers in the event of agriculture, agriculture shocks. Um, what then have been our challenges in the program? This program is funded 100%. I'll not go by the, by, by the slides, you'll be up with me. This program is 100% funded by the government. So at times, because of exchequer issues, we are never really to reach scale as we had planned. Another thing we have seen outside the field is there is limited understanding of the farmers about agriculture insurance. Very limited understanding about farmers about agriculture insurance. Farmers believe that once they have been, they have, they have gotten a cover for the crop, whether they are above the threshold or not, compensation should be done at the end of the season. And that one has been a real problem about uh, this program in the field. So that kind of information asymmetry, which has been exhibited by the farmers and even certain agents in the field, kind of has led to the low adoption of the program by the farmers. So I think, as I come to the recommendation, that's a strong area that a lot of funding should be able to be channeled towards what? Towards farmer awareness creation. Two, what we have also seen here is um, the legislation which is in place right now is not expressly supportive towards agriculture insurance in the country. Insurance in the country is regulated by the Insurance Regulatory Authority in Kenya, and that is under the Ministry of Finance. We have in place an Insurance Act which received its last revision in 2006. But when you look at that, uh, when you look at that act, uh, uh, the classification of uh, agriculture, it has been placed under the miscellaneous class. Now, when you put agriculture under miscellaneous class, the, the commissioner of insurance by law, he is only mandated to report on the class but not develop it. So you, you find that you, 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 you will rarely see you know, programs by the, by, the, by the regulator targeting agriculture insurance in the market. No wonder the little space or the, the little knowledge of farmers about agriculture insurance. Then two, we we do not have a, a policy really which has been approved uh, right now we have made significant strides we have a draft kenya national insurance policy but it's yet to be debated in in the cabinet so we, you you cannot really use it as a public document so the the, the environment really the the, 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 the 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 it's not conducive enough you know for the for the growth and development of agriculture insurance in the country 
So moving forward, therefore, as in terms of recommendations, that one, I would say, is that we, there is need to, in, to, to increase awareness creation for agriculture insurance in the country. Yes, there is appetite for uh, agriculture insurance in, in the country, especially for the farmers and the persons who stay in the asal areas. They have borne more the brand of these shops, and therefore, if they can have any intervention that can assist them to be able to you know, to, to, to navigate around these agricultural shocks, it is very much well welcome. But there is need to increase awareness uh, uh, towards agricultural insurance. Two, there is also need to um, increase funding for agriculture insurance. Personal as I stand here, and my sister Mary is here, and my other brothers, I believe that it's good to have a homegrown solution. In as much as there'll be donors, but there is need for the government really to come in strong and be able to support the program uh, so that it is actual home grade. We are able to, to move with it because uh, we know the benefits which accrue when we have got this place, uh, this program in place. And then to, uh, the next one is to fast track the completion of the national insurance policy and also to, to watch for the removal of agriculture insurance from the miscellaneous class to a standalone class so that now efforts can be geared towards the development of that class. Uh, that way, to me, is, is going to bring many farmers into board. Uh, to, as we speak now, agriculture insurance, or agriculture insurance is voluntary. It is not mandatory. Uh, there are other jurisdictions where I have gone to where agriculture insurance is actually mandatory. So that every farmer, for example in India, who goes to access uh, who goes to access uh, funds from an institution for agriculture purposes, he or she is supposed to acquire insurance at the point at the point where he takes the credit. And I believe moving forward, we can do that. Other thing we have learned is that uh, retailing agriculture insurance as a standalone, you cannot reach scale. It's difficult. Why? Because agriculture has not been remunerated enough for the farmer to have enough disposable income that he or she can use to pay for agriculture insurance. So that if a farmer has got priorities to do, agriculture insurance becomes number last. So we, 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 we are saying that for this kind of farmer to be assisted, then agriculture insurance must have a value add. And from where I sit then, the value add should be bundling of insurance either with the credit or bundling of insurance with the farm inputs. When you do so, then the, the product then will, will have a value add and many farmers can go into it. Uh, so, uh, for the livestock insurance, yes, we began together uh, when we, we instituted the crop insurance uh, uh, with a program called Kenya Livestock Insurance Program, which was basically uh, uh, operating in eight ASAL counties. But that program now has since graduated into drive and the drive is just in its formative stages. It will also be, be, uh, uh, be covering uh, uh, pastoralists within the, 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 the 14 ASAL counties uh, in the country. And I think I beg to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, next uh, speaker is Somalia. Please come. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Zain. I work with the Ministry of Agriculture in Somalia. Um, I want to first recognize the host country, the Republic of Kenya, and uh, our friends, in particular, the Ministry of Agriculture, for the warm reception that we often receive when in Kenya. I equally want to um, salute 
and recognize in this forum the efforts of uh, Dr. Fida, the Herukli, I call it Heroclean, Heroclean effort. Uh, because, you know, bringing everyone in one room, discussing this topic is not easy. Um, and in particular for me, what I very much value in these discussions is the knowledge sharing. Because as you can imagine, we're not on the same spectrum. We've got Ethiopia, Kenya very much ahead. We have others who are in the middle. So for us to be in one room, listening the experiences of others does two things. First, it gives us a nudge, tells us we really need to pull our socks The other thing is, it actually uh, inspires us to push our leaders in Somalia and say we really need to push this thing. It's working in Kenya, it's working in Ethiopia, there's no reason why we don't push this. So I want to really commend you, Dr. Feder, for this effort and uh, thank you. Um, right. The issue of food security, as uh, you all know, is, uh, on the, is a top agenda globally. I was in Dakar earlier in February. The African Development Bank uh, organized a high-level summit on food security, um, and the title of it was Feed Africa. Um, and again, this is an initiative, an African initiative. How do we uh, stop relying on food imports but actually invest in our own agricultural sector to be able to sustain ourselves. And this is how I see microinsurance fits into this because it actually, uh, if we get it right, it will stimulate the agricultural sector to produce more. Now, I'm asked to give a, a, an indication where we are in Somalia, so I will do that. Um, okay, so in Somalia, uh, we have very limited penetration of the microinsurance products. Um, there's several reasons for that, but we're making some progress. Uh, we've got, as my colleague from Ethiopia mentioned, Project Drive. It's uh, funded by uh, World Bank. It's a, a new initiative, um, a de-risking initiative. Um, a, we also have had uh, some good effort by some rep consortium uh, that has been working in collaboration with the International Livestock Research Institute, uh, A, to raise awareness, uh, as well as work with the government to assess the feasibility of um, microinsurance in Somalia. So other than that, we don't really have a, a strong penetration of the microinsurance products in Somalia, but we're starting. I, you know, I was very much inspired. I mean, I don't know if you can see this, uh, this diagram. When we look at where we are, Africa, compared to where Asia, Europe, and Latin America is, you see that there is huge, huge scope for us in Africa to pick up the microinsurance. Um, we're not really reinventing the wheel. We just need to, I think, um, pick up, inspire our farmers and our leaders to ensure that we adopt the microinsurance uh, in, in Somalia and in our region, I get region. As I mentioned, so the World Bank in 2019 uh, funded a feasibility study for index-based uh, livestock insurance. The study established that there is a technical viability. Uh, the study also looked at uh, Somali territory, which has a, a potential for uptake as well as socioeconomic impact. Um, as you'll see shortly in the next slide, 70% um, of Somali ter territory is viable. The private, uh, the drive project by the World Bank, on the other hand, uh, which is already starting, I'm told it's collected about $600,000 in premium. Of course, when you look at our, our, our colleagues from Kenya and Ethiopia, that's not a, a, a you know, it's, a, it's a quite a significant, not a significant amount, but I think it's a good start. And, but the dry project, again, like the uh, initiative by SOMREP, is focusing in the livestock sector. We, in crop insurance, we don't really have much activity. Um, 
we of course still um, trying it's not easy there are challenges as will become apparent shortly uh, but talking about the index based livestock insurance in Somalia that I talked about uh, so SOMREP has been taking the lead in cooperation with the federal government of Somalia and the Ministry of Livestock as you can see in the map of Somalia here uh, all of this has been seen to be viable for index-based uh, livestock insurance. Um, what else? But again, uh, it's a feasibility study. We, the actual uh, work on the ground that we are seeing is being pushed by the World Bank and Drive. Uh, and of course, we still haven't had uh, results to uh, assess. We know that it's been an uptake. Small, but it's a good start. Uh, I think I also want to touch on something which is important for us to understand, uh, at least from, from my country. You know, de-risking and risk pooling is, is, is the essence of the concept of microfinance. You know, microfinance is defined in the literature as insurance that operates by risk pooling, financed through regular premium, and is tailored to the poor. Uh, and that's the key word that I underline. Uh, you know, it is tailored for the poor. We know it works. India has the largest and most successful microinsurance market in Asia. Morocco, likewise, in Africa, has a very mature microinsurance sector. And uh, as you heard, uh, uh, very good progress has been made in Kenya, particularly in index-based insurance. Our brothers in Ethiopia are very well ahead of us equally. But, you know, there are challenges to microinsurance, and we shouldn't really just gloss over them, at least from my perspective in Somalia. The challenges are that microinsurance must be affordable. There is no point in offering a microinsurance product that is not affordable to the, the smallholder farmer. You know, and the other thing is that, at least from our perspective in Somalia, is it needs to be commercially viable. When you look at the Indian example, um, the Indian state really played a significant role in the uptake of the microinsurance product, and later on, it became a commercially viable exercise. And so, you know, uh, when I talk about risk pooling, I want to highlight one thing. You know, when we have crop failure in Somalia, or when we have drought, when you have the whole livestock dies, um, it is a quite a heavy toll for any uh, insurance provider to take. So we need, in my view, a regional approach. And this is where Dr. Fida comes in. I mean, Somalia, I don't know if you are familiar, we are uh, applied to join the common market for East African and Southern Africa, which is, uh, of course, uh, quite a large economic organization. But uh, I think it's important to have a regional approach to microfinance because, um, you know, through diversifying uh, risk and geographies, I mean, I don't think that, you know, when you have drought that it, re it touches the entire region at once. I think there are pockets and this can create diversification and make it viable commercially. But if we try to, you know, push microfinance uh, at state level, it would require strong support from the state. Because, um, as you can imagine, I mean, I talk about uh, Somalia, we've had the recent, until recently, we had the fifth failed rainy season. Now, I want you to convince a private sector insurance company to join micro, microfinance, say, I want you to protect the entire you know, agricultural sector in Somalia. They need to make a profit. Without a profit, uh, it's, it's difficult. And this is where the, the state comes in. Um, but one thing we're good at in Somalia, wherever there is a small profit, you will get a lot of, uh, I'm sure you know, a lot of businesses, you know. So, uh, in summary, microinsurance works. It has worked in India. It works in Morocco. It works in Kenya. It works in Ethiopia. Microinsurance can play a significant role in reassuring the smallholder farmer. Someone, I said this before, you know, when you are facing with a fifth drought season uh, or f f rain, failed rainy, rainy season, 
and you tell the small farmer, you know, put your last five hundred dollars by by seeds and 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 and, and you know and and uh, plant, he's going to think twice. But if you tell him, I can, you know, ensure you that if it does not yield, I will pay you. I think that farmer will see, uh, will, will will plant those seeds. Micro insurance plays an important role in food security, um, and so for me, I think. Uh, it's the right approach, and it's an important component if we want to ensure our food security. In Somalia overall, we're still in infant stages. We need to evaluate, calibrate, and I think uh, we will be learning uh, very closely from our friends and brothers in Kenya and Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Okay, I call, I call up on uh, South Sudan now. Next. Good morning. My name is Cesar Rico. I will take you through the presentation on uh, risk transfer in South Sudan. The performance. In my team, we have Mary Ezra from the Ministry of Agriculture, Malesh Alinana from the Ministry of Agriculture, Dr. James Nial Roach from Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, and myself, uh, Cesar Rico, from South Sudan Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture. Um, actually, uh, uh, my colleague from Somalia, uh, Zain, said that uh, Kenya is doing the best, and others in the middle, and he did not mention the last. Uh, in South Sudan, we are struggling. The first step has not yet been achieved. But Chinese say that a trip of 1,000 miles starts with one step, the first steps. When we look at the, um, the agriculture and the livestock sector in South Sudan, about 80% of the, of the population are, uh, or 80% of the household depending on uh, uh, farming, actually. So farming, uh, most of the I national income in South Sudan come from oil, but uh, agriculture represents 36%. And when we look at the livestock alone, um, IGAD itself has assessed it in, 20, in 2015, 2018, and it makes about 30 billion of the GDP. So uh, actually, uh, the agriculture and livestock uh, sectors in South Sudan are suffering of so many risks. Although uh, when we look at uh, microinsurance, we just focus on a few of them. But the, the the, the risk in South Sudan include drought, flood, transboundary pest, desert, locust, birds, and there is man-made risk also. This is the conflict that you always hear about in South Sudan. And also we have also infected Sudan with it, and they took it there seriously. We pray that the situation will settle in Sudan. Uh, since the year 2022, we have an estimate of 1 million people affected by severe flood. So all these catas catastrophes, when we take them combined, it has caused a lot of uh, problems in our country. We have been losing crops and pastures, and uh, it has created huge uh, food gap. And the pastoralists and farmers, they are always displaced. 
When we look at the risk of the pest, as you have seen in the picture here, and mainly it is in a place called Eastern Equatoria, and uh, Eastern Equatoria is bordering Kenya uh, and Uganda, and even part of Ethiopia. So uh, other parts of South Sudan are also now suffering of this kind of pest. In South Sudan, the mechanism we have in place, but it's actually it's not that regular. There is foul uh, desert, lo lo desert locust watch. It predicts if there is a, a locust coming or no. This is how South Sudan look like in terms of cows and South Sudan as a country with the neighbors. On the top there, we have South Sudan, uh, we have Sudan and the other East African countries in the south. There are actually six neighbors, and sometimes the situation is vulnerable to, uh, to some, some risk that can come from other countries. Uh, our current status, I can tell you that uh, there is no livestock service, uh, crop and livestock insurance service in South Sudan. But we are thinking seriously to have it. Uh, myself and uh, my sister Mary here, we were trying to push at least we can get something little from the government in the budget of uh, this year. But I think we have nothing at hand. We don't have plan. We don't have even. So the situation needs to be advocated seriously. And I hope by next year, if I stand, before you in this way, I can say something different that uh, the, the first step of a micro uh, risk transfer in South Sudan being achieved. Uh, when we look at the occurrence and uh, problems, is actually greatly increasing in South Sudan and also fluctuating in other risk, which uh, uh, we need to bring it to the attention of the government seriously and the leaders that these things need to be handled in a different way. Microinsurance should be there. Uh, we need the policies, we need so many things to, uh, to support these uh, initiatives, uh, it's micro, uh, risk transfer in South Sudan. Uh, when we look at the policies and regulation in South Sudan, Actually, we don't have it for risk transfer in South Sudan, but what we have, there is likeness, some documents that can actually address other things in agriculture and livestock sector, but uh, not uh, risk transfer and microinsurance. For example, we have the National Efforts of Agriculture Transformation. Uh, is a document, is a very good document, is a combination of two documents actually, the comprehensive agriculture master plan and the zonal effort for agriculture transformation. But each of the two that make the national effort for agriculture transformation has uh, different things to address. And then we have other measures uh, sometimes it's taken jointly by FAO and WFP, like crop and food security uh, assessment mission. Uh, they do it every year, and they give us the status and uh, to the decision makers what they can take. And also we have uh, national agriculture and livestock policy, and uh, also WFP is providing a small to the small and progressive farmers uh, some support under a project called Agriculture Resilience Project. Um, there is a livestock development policy in South Sudan where it has captured the intention uh, of the government to, in to introduce uh, index-based livestock insurance system. 
but uh, it still has not come to the surface. The Minister of Environment, together with the United Nations uh, Environment Program, uh, it was sometimes back in January 2012, they have a kind of assessment, um, environmental impact, risk and opportunities assessment on the natural resource of, uh, in South Sudan in regard to climate change and so on. These are the kind of policies, but uh, when we look at the uh, main institutions who are supposed to take that responsibilities or who are really close to such activity, we have uh, the National Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security at the forefront. And then we have also Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries. And there is lead organization like FAO, WFP, and VSF. We have uh, a number of VSF, VSF Belgium, VSF Canada, Swiss, and so on. Uh, from our side, uh, in the agriculture uh, sector, in the Chamber of Commerce, we also have much care about that. And uh, we have Agriculture Producers Union. Actually, it is an active agriculture organization in South Sudan. And uh, we have already shared uh, this issue. And I hope when funds come to our hand, uh, we will work together. When we look at the major challenges, we have issues of capacity to handle risk management technique so that we can have a proper risk assessment and analysis, evaluations, and other risk, risk uh, activities that to take place. Uh, we, when we look at the uh, impact of such situation, it is actually difficult to manage in the absence of uh, insurance. For example, in, in, a ki in any states in South Sudan, um, if there is disasters, at least we, we need to help few farmers, few farmers and livestock owners, at least 10%. So in the absence of any insurance uh, risk transfer mechanism in place, it will be difficult for us to compensate, to help, or... Also, um, the issue of funds to do whatever uh, relevant activities is really difficult. Uh, market inf uh, information and investment. If, uh, the market inform if the market is dynamic, we will expect that people will really take care that uh, nothing will come and damage the crops or the livestock because this is money. But all this is at the hand of the um, low income, the villagers, and so on. So sometimes it's difficult uh, to handle. Um, we also have a pastoral list from the neighboring countries. Some even, they come from West Africa. They come to South Sudan with their animals and uh, they collide and some from Sudan every year they move uh, it is the line of their migration they collide with the locals and uh, um, there is a lot of loose happen people die they fight and so on and then at the end they say that come we sit and settle uh, which is not a good uh, a good situation when you see pastoralists coming from West Africa through Central Africa to South Sudan. Uh, the grazing land uh, being also exposed to risk and, uh, and the people start fighting. Uh, it's not a good sign of uh, having a, a good um, livestock sector in South Sudan. Also, the cooperatives and, uh, and the microfinance 
and other institutions that we can have it to support the risk transfer and uh, microinsurance activities that are not uh, in a good setup. They also need to be supported in a way that they can function uh, and support micro initiative if it is introduced in South Sudan. When we look at the lesson learned, uh, we see that uh, there is so many risk encountered in South Sudan. Farmers and pastoralists have lost. And all this, in the absence of micro uh, insurance uh, in place. So uh, from that, we have learned that we need to have something to protect the farmers and the pastoralists. When we look at the opportunities, we look at the readiness of the South Sudanese, if such initiative in place, how they will accept it. And then the willingness of the private sector. Uh, I have shared with some, uh, uh, some insurance companies. I got only one person, one insurance company that have very good idea about, uh, actually he's a CEO for one of the insurance companies and he's a Kenyan guy. He said that such initiative, if, if we took it, it will also boost the investment and in the insurance sector in South Sudan. The third opportunity that we have in place is the current initiative uh, by EGAD. It will open the way for us and for the agriculture and livestock to obtain this kind of uh, risk transfer mechanism in place. Uh, in our recommendation here, we have a list but I will just say a few of them, uh, like um, like the, the actors, including the farmers and pastoralists, they need to be sensitized. The microfinance, microinsurance, cooperatives, and other setup of investment in the country, we need to uh, sensitize them. We need also to carry out uh, feasibility on index-based livestock and crop insurance. And we need to strengthen uh, the relevant institutions. Uh, one of my aim is uh, in the government, we are looking if we could have a department or a directorate in the Ministry of Agriculture to champion microinsurance and risk transfer in South Sudan. If uh, that is in place, at least we could have, and also in the private sector, for us in the Chamber of Commerce, it might be strengthened in a way that we can lead the investment in a very good way. Uh, this is all from South Sudan. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, South Sudan. Okay, Sudan is next. Last but not least, Sudan. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation for this very important issue. And thanks for the leadership of Dr. Abdi to this very important unit in IGAD. Uh, so, why it is not working? <laughs> Just an introduction that Sudan is a very rich country in all uh, natural resources that can make Sudan and other countries, neighbor countries, uh, f food secure. But many carriers and risks and hazards are encountered to make it, uh, to make this uh, not a reality. Uh, so, excuse me, can you?
Uh, the current situation in Sudan, I can talk before yeah. you fix the problem, yes. Uh, the current situation in Sudan, in terms of food security and food system, uh, we face uh, a lot of problems, vulnerabilities, due to these challenges, as I said in, in the first, that we have the resources and we have the manpower and we have everything to do Sudan uh, food secure country and uh, also for neighboring countries. But uh, this is the, the 3C, as you know, uh, climate change, conflict, displacement. Now uh, in the ongoing conflict, the displaced people from Khartoum and therefore which uh, fighting is active, are more than 1 million point five to other yeah. safe Same states time. and 700,000 to neighboring countries. Uh, so uh, this increased the fragility of the situation for agriculture, food security in the country. Yes, for the current status, uh, as I said, Sudan is facing a multi-hazard and multi-risk uh, risk situation uh, due to many conditions which can be presented. Uh, the most of them are the best and diseases. And now, as uh, my colleague from South Sudan says that, there is science for, uh, for uh, uh, desert locust which can come to Sudan and uh, through other countries. Uh, this will be uh, a challenge for the current uh, season, which is starting Sudan from uh, July. And within these uh, difficult moments, uh, all the Ministry of Agriculture and related ministries they are working very hard to make this uh, uh, season uh, succeed. Because if it does not succeed with these uh, multi hazards uh, in, the, in the country, uh, the people can feel hunger. Uh, according to IBC, the last IBC analysis, uh, we have no people in phase five, but there are a lot of people in crisis situation and emergency situation. Uh, many, many uh, partners and uh, outside and inside the country, they are working to, uh, to make this situation better. Uh, uh, in any uh, intervention or program, we have to answer three questions in terms of risk and risk transfer how to manage the risk, how to reduce the risk, and how to reduce the impact of uh, the hazard and risk. If, if all these issues are captured in our intervention, it will give us good results and better outcomes. Otherwise, I think bits and pieces can do nothing for uh, the countries. Uh, the main challenges we faced in risk transfer are the data. We have a very good uh, database system but it needs many. There are many gaps in terms of assessment because uh, uh, relying our uh, situation analysis in uh, secondary data, I think it will not reflect the actual situation. Uh, also the assessment, there is no fund for assessment, very big gap in assessment in terms for food security and nutrition situation. And, and uh, the other uh, thing is the capacities. Uh, the capacities of producers, community mobilizations, and even staff who are working in food security and uh, agriculture and food security in the country. Uh, also the fund. We have the plans, we have the strategies, legislations, and every uh, uh, software is there. But to implement these plans and interventions, we face a very big gap in terms of fund analyzing. We are like other uh, regional, regional uh, countries here in IGAD region. Uh, coordination also, we need coordination in terms of national, regional, and global partners. I hear here there are some uh, projects from partners in some countries. But Sudan uh, get a very limited chance in these projects. Uh, please, we need all IGAD uh, countries and all IGAD uh, to focus in Sudan due to this existing situation. Because we, we, we never see it before 
in Sudan or in other uh, countries in the region. Marketing functionality also is uh, a problem towards or against the transfer of risk and uh, to reduce the impact of risk in terms of marketing structures, in terms of fluctuation of prices, high cost of inputs, and all these issues, which link directly to macroeconomic and microeconomic uh, situation in the country. Uh, one of the lessons learned is that uh, we, we managed to succeed and have a very good and abundant production in last season because all the risk have been captured, all the hazards have been addressed. And so we have like 7.8 million tons of stable food crops, and we think that is a very good surplus. And if we do not gain this production last year, with, uh, with this ongoing conflict now, the people can feel in hunger. But uh, it, is, it supports the people and the food security of the people. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, a lot of risk, uh, risk uh, analysis units and entities in most of the ministries, the government ministries, like Minister of Finance, Minister of Agriculture. Uh, in Minister of Agriculture, not like South Sudan, we have a unit for risk transfer and macro insurance. Also, we have uh, some banks who provide uh, microfinance for risk transfer, like the Agricultural Bank in Sudan. Uh, they support and uh, they fund some agricultural activities. But the shortcoming of this bank is that they provide uh, finance for the big, big producers because of the guarantee. So now we change these modalities and to give support to small-scale farmers who are the fairest who are exposed to vulnerabilities in the country. Uh, Emphasis sector, food security and livelihood sector also, now they, they, they want to change the mechanism for risk and building the resilience for a vulnerable population and sustain the livelihood of the small-scale producers. We have policies, but I, I say that the implementation is a challenge because of the fund. Uh, if our projects in Sudan, now we have uh, like uh, projects in nine states out of 18 states, the safe states now, and within these projects, risk transfer is there. Uh, also, FAO, FAO, they support us very much in terms of inputs, in terms of uh, follow up, information, appreciate the role of FAO. EGAD also, they have some projects in uh, livestock. Uh, insurance, and they are working with the Livestock Ministry. We have what is called National Council for uh, Environment and, uh, and uh, Natural Resources. Also, they have a big project for uh, microfinance for uh, risk and hazards. Uh, food security system, we are we go into this uh, initiative. We have uh, something going on with uh, EGAD and uh, the Global Net for Network for Food crisis and the hub, and we are working on track five, which is mainly concerned about uh, resilience building, peace building, and risk transfer. Our recommendation is first, I think we, we have to increase the opportunity for Sudan to join these uh, very important uh, events. Now I see uh, most of the countries, they have like three or four participants. But for Sudan, I am the only one who represents the country. So <laughs> please, this is a request from my side. Uh, opportunities also, as I said, for uh, the existing and the coming uh, projects, funds, and partner, we have to strengthen. We, we request IGA to strengthen our link to these uh, partners and funding uh, authorities. Need for regional risk transfer strategy. It is very important. We have not to work alone, each country to work alone to build their strategies, plans, uh, policies, plans. So an integrated regional risk transfer uh, strategy is very important. Also, I, 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 I forget to add to the killings the food loss and waste. This is a very big risk for our countries from the beginning of production until consumption and market. We have a, a study on, uh, on uh, food loss and waste. We find that 30% of our production from the stable food crops is lost. And I, I think for 
very rough estimation we find that if we reserve this loss, we can feed like four million people from the former uh, population in Sudan. So I need also for a strategy and intervention, this loss is very important. How to mobilize the resources and how to strengthen coordination and integration between the countries in the region, strengthen the early warning and early action. Uh, for early warning, yes, the situation is good, but early action is this, uh, till now is uh, left behind. Activate and find the sources for Africa composition. This Africa composition established after the initiative of the system transformation. But till now, there is no output. I don't know for other countries, for, but for Sudan, we, we do not see anything from this uh, uh, composition. Integration of resilience building and livestock sustainability in all uh, projects in all countries. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, so, our uh, last presentation is uh, Uganda. Thank you. My name is Catherine Aimsiwe. Currently, I head the Department of Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Management under the Office of the Prime Minister in Uganda. I'll make a presentation on key risk transfer and microinsurance performance. It's general. It covers uh, disaster and agricultural insurance since those are the active ones. And I'll talk about those that are not active briefly and way forward. It's, it's moving on the screen, but it's not moving here, so I'll just keep, so thank you. Uh, I'll start with um, the first slide, which is on disaster vulnerability in Uganda. And um, disaster, <coughs> Uganda is vulnerable to multiple climatic hazards like floods, droughts, landslides, and then earthquakes, epidemics, social unrest, and displacement shocks. Climate change is expected to increase, as all of you are aware and the frequency of severity of weather-related disasters through more intense temperatures, more variable rainfall patterns, and prolonged heat waves. At the, the global ranking, sorry, it seems I'm reading from a different. There's a problem because what is here is not.
Sorry, it looks like also the computer radar was presenting about disaster. So, Uganda is vulnerable to a multiple climatic hazards such as droughts, floods, storms, earthquakes, epidemics, social unrest, and displacement shocks. Climate change is expected to increase the frequency and severity of uh, weather-related disasters, which would increase the intensity of temperatures, more variable rainfall patterns, and prolonged heat waves. At the global ranking of climate disaster risk, Uganda ranks 58 out of 181 countries. The disaster events have been increasing in frequency over the past 20 years, and the economic losses are largely uninsured. Landslides severely affect livelihoods, and this may increase government contingent liability due to landslide risk. However, droughts of high intensity and medium frequency, while floods of medium severity but high in frequency. So that means that droughts have an adverse impact on the country's economic growth. Uh, you'll see those two maps. They are from the National Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, which was compiled by Office of the Prime Minister and launched in 2020. It is to last for a period of five years, which means that after 2025, we shall be uh, compiling a new atlas. So I'll start with the drought hazard. And the category is uh, starts the high, very high starts from red. Some of you who know Karamoja area in the east border in Kenya, you can see that. And the next is the orange, some districts in Karamoja and then northeastern. We call that part their districts from Teso and Lango, and then we come along the Nile. We have some districts from Machodi and West Nile. The yellow part is the moderate. You can see there's a yellow. I know men are color blind, but not all. So I can see the deep yellow. <laughs> so you'll be able to see it. That one, we call it the Kato Corridor and much as it shows moderate, but it can really get dry as well. Then there's the light yellow, which is low, that tends to be in the southwestern part of the country that borders Rwanda, and then also the other side of Gwenzori that borders DRC. The second map shows the flood hazard. The flood hazard, you can see the intensity and the hazard is in the east as well. What does that mean? The eastern part of the country is more vulnerable to disasters, both in terms of floods and drought. Because you can see the flood is uh, around Teso, around Lake Choga, and then it also goes to the Bukhed region that borders uh, Kenya, that is around Votareja, and then the Bududas that still have landslides. You come along the Nile in the Achoni and then also downwards around the Ruenzori and then southwest that borders DRC at the same time Rwanda. So that is how the hazard two hazards are spread in the country and categorized. The disaster impacts. We have epidemics that are low in severity but high in frequency. They occur, they occur nearly every year, and each event costs about three million US dollars. Uganda continues to experience significant displacement shocks, which will cost an estimated US dollars, 800 million in 2023. This is in relation to the refugees specifically. And the agriculture sector that is the main employer in Uganda and a major contributor to national GDP is the one that is even mostly affected by these disasters. Extreme events such as drought have caused significant losses to the agriculture sector, with impact in the recent past in the range of 1 to 7 percent of GDP. This is according to the Ministry of Water and Environment 2015. We go to policies and frameworks on insurance. We shall start, since I'm talking about disasters, I'll start with the Constitution. And 
indicate how disasters are catered for in these policies, then we'll go to the insurance. The 1995 Constitution stipulates that the state has the obligation to establish an effective mechanism to deal with any disaster resulting from natural calamities or any situation causing a general displacement of people or a serious disruption of their normal life. It lays out a strong foundation enabling proper mainstreaming of disaster risk management in the country's development plan and vision. So in the Uganda Vision 2040, it recognizes the importance of strengthening the country's resilience to the impacts of climate change. The NDP3, that is the National Development Plan that we are using currently, includes a dedicated program on climate change, natural resources, environment, and water management with a clear objective of reducing human and economic loss from human hazards and disasters. Specifically, this one encourages early warning systems to reduce on the economic losses and hazards and disasters. Then we have the National Social Policy, Social Protection Policy 2015. It also underscores the importance of social protection in addressing risks and vulnerabilities of persons. Although this one has a gap, much as it talks about addressing risks and vulnerabilities of persons, it left out disaster shocks. So currently it is under the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, it is being reviewed to include disaster shocks in social protection. The Climate Change Act 2021 provides for establishment of a climate change fund as a special mechanism for climate change financing with some contribution from government. To the policies, the Department of Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Management in Office of the Prime Minister has a national disaster, disaster policy on disaster preparedness and management, which was approved by cabinet in 2011. So how far have we gone? There's a policy now we need to develop the bill to have a law, which is more legally binding. On this one, the disaster risk management principles to formulate a disaster law have been drafted and ready to present to cabinet, and this aims to strengthen the application of the existing policy. This is ready, it has been taken through all the procedures at policy level for the technical and political. Now we are waiting to be put on the agenda for cabinet and we discuss to allow the minister go ahead and draft the law as per the requirement of the government. The National Disaster Preparedness and Management also assigns the National Emergency Coordination and Operation Center several coordination functions dealing with onset, sudden onset natural and human induced emergencies. What we call the NECOC is a unit within the department, so it is not separate. We coordinate, do work together to deal with sudden onset natural and human induced emergencies. The Public Finance Management Act 2015 established the contingency funds. Sectoral ministries may request from Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, supplementary resources to cover the cost of their sector's response to a natural disaster. This Public Finance and Management Act 2015 has a gap. Much as it talks about the contingency fund, it's only for response to disasters so it does not cater for preparedness. In the proposed principles for the bill, we are proposing an amendment to this act so that the contingency fund is able to take care of disaster preparedness as well, not only management. Status of risk transfer and microinsurance in Uganda. Insurance companies in Uganda operate under the terms and conditions of the Insurance Act 2017. There is significant progress in formulating regulations to bring the Insurance Act's provisions into effect, including microinsurance. On this, we have uh, disaster risk financing, we have agriculture insurance that we are going to talk about, and we are also developing the disaster risk financing strategy. 
The work on microinsurance regulations will contribute to facilitating access of the poor and vulnerable to insurance solutions. That picture shows existing risk finance to disaster response. You see we have agricultural insurance scheme. It is there, but there is limited penetration. Livestock is not yet covered. Households and business insurance is limited. Public assets insurance is not available. Sovereign insurance not available. Contingency fund. Yes, it is there, but it's non-accumulating and it has been operational since 2018. 0.5% of previous financial expenditure is the one that goes into the contingency fund. Then contingency credit is limited to Northern Uganda Social Action Fund. This is, uh, it relies on donor funds. So we have had three NUSAFs, one, two, three, and we are designing the fourth one that I'm going to talk about briefly. Uh, this contingency credit also falls under the Displacement Refugees Development Program. So what happens when there is a disaster? We do reprioritization from the budget and we also do supplementary budgets. This takes a lot of time and also the resources that are meant to be used for other sectors like roads, you find they have been now reallocated to cater for disasters that affects other sectors of the economy. The source of this is the World Bank analysis and also Office of the Prime Minister. Case study. Government of Uganda piloted shock response to social protection by incorporating disaster risk finance mechanism to scale up protection in response to disaster shocks in Karamoja between 2016 and 2019. That was under NUSAF 3. The disaster risk financing mechanism enabled labor-intensive public works programs to expand temporarily and assist poor and vulnerable households immediately following crisis or shocks, primarily climate shocks that exacerbate food insecurity such as drought. How this worked, we would uh, do a technical analysis on the drought, like I showed you earlier, Karamoja being the highly prone region to drought. <coughs> Then whenever we reach a threshold, to reach a threshold, we worked with the sectors uh, that are mandated to be <coughs> sorry, in charge of drought. So whenever we reach the threshold, we trigger financing. So when there's a drought, that doesn't mean that people are sick. They will do labor intensive public works on uh, government roads or community roads or watersheds and then they are paid some money. That money they would be paid, they used it to buy food. They would even some, even money to get the balance and they bought other items for as so other sources of livelihoods to the households. So the DRF mechanism performed well in building households resilience to disasters. And it was triggered in 2017, 18, 19, and 2020, and provided support a total of that number of beneficiaries equal to 108% of the target number of beneficiaries. An evaluation study conducted in October 2018 by World Bank found that 98% of beneficiaries were satisfied with the disaster risk financing modality. The study noted that the mechanism enabled households to acquire food reserves to cushion against and mitigate the effects of drought. Now that it is a success, the government of Uganda together with World Bank have designed disaster risk financing under, national, under Northern Uganda Social Action Fund 4 to cover two hazards. Apparently it was only drought, but now we have also added floods and to cover a bigger geographical coverage, that is Karamoja and Northern Uganda. I got another case study of the insurance in Uganda, agricultural insurance. The project started as a five-year pilot project on 1st July 2016, with the objective of cushioning farmers against production losses arising from natural disasters. How it works, direct farmer interface in their cooperatives, circles, area inter 
cooperative enterprises, village saving loan schemes, financial institutions by law of ensuring loans disbursed purposely for agricultural production, insurance companies, countrywide branch network, and broking fraternities. So agriculture insurance in Uganda is subsidized. There is a premium subsidy of 5 billion Uganda shillings every year that is budgeted for. Then there are tax exemptions for agriculture insurance. 18% VAT is charged on all insurance policies in the country except agriculture insurance. Stamp duty was also scrapped off on all agriculture insurance policies, effective financial 2022 stroke 23. There is also a request for increase in the allocation of uh, government subsidy from 5 billion to 15 billion. This paper was submitted to the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development by the Insurance Regulatory Authority in collaboration with Agro Consortium. All agriculture insurance products are regulated by Insurance Regulatory Authority that has the law as indicated earlier, which was approved. Challenges. The subsidy allocated is no longer adequate. The growth appreciation of agriculture insurance has thus resulted in maximum and full utilization of the subsidy allocated. There is increased unpredictability of climate conditions and weather. It means constant adjustments and investments in tools to keep up with the trends and results on the ground, making the cost of insurance continue to rise rather than fall. Limited number of specialist agricultural risk and adjustment service providers. This is related to capacity. Then basis risk, this comes when the observed monitoring varies greatly with the actual experience on ground. This increases distrust in the public. <coughs> this second last is related to the last one, poor data collection methods and information management. Because if you don't have data, then you stand the risk of relying on data, which is not correct. Recommendations and way forward. There is need to develop more inclusive risk transfer solutions such as insurance regulations which will be especially relevant for low income earners. You, we have um, the national health insurance that has been developed but cannot be discussed here because it's not yet presented in parliament. So that is also another one in offering to cater for microinsurance. Then there's need to differentiate a state of disaster from state of emergency and clarify measures to prevent a natural disaster situation from becoming a crisis. In the constitution, we have a state of emergency which takes His Excellency the President to declare. So at times you find there's a disaster that really can be categorized as an emergency in terms of disaster, but it, it cannot happen. So we have proposed in the new law the, for the minister responsible for disaster to declare a state of emergency, give through the protocols of declaring a disaster emergency as per the standards. The Disaster Risk Management Bill is an opportunity to include provisions on the disaster risk financing and clarity on the roles and responsibilities of Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development. When Minister of Finance reads disaster, they tend to get it to take that as an issue of disaster that OPM handle yet. They are the people in charge of the finances. They have a role to play. So we have also catered for this in the bill. The last recommendation, there is need for more informal sector individuals to take up insurance. Conclusion, disaster risk financing in Uganda is mainly exposed through supplementary budget and reallocation, which shifts resources away from planned projects, can be time consuming and undermine development of objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much all for uh, the presentations. Uh, we have uh, had the opportunity to explore into the risk transfer and microinsurance mechanism in the region, and also a kind of comparative uh, view of uh, where the institutional framework, the practice, and the best practice lesson, uh, the challenges and uh, recommendations to to look. We were able to 
to explore that across uh, uh, member states. And, uh, varied practice, varied challenges, dissimilar situations, and also common um, common things things in common in terms of uh, the state the state of risk insurance and the group based uh, risk transfer mechanisms in the region. Thank you very much. All this was a very enlightening uh, presentation and. Uh, uh, I take the opportunity once again to extend our gratitude for your participation and for such a well-structured and organized uh, knowledge sharing uh, on the subject. Now uh, we'll take about 10 to 15 minutes to reflect on what has been uh, presented by uh, member states uh, representatives and then to exchange questions and answers and reflections. The floor is open. Uh, your, your views on this will matter for, for also taking this initiative forward. Uh, the, the floor is open. Question, answer, reflections. Who we'll take the lead to break the deadlock, <laughs> the silence. Uh, OK. The, the, Thank you once again. Uh, I have two, three questions for particularly Ethiopia and South Sudan, according to what we have seen now. Mel, uh, can't you say that we, as Ethiopians, they are insuring crops? Are there specific crops that they are uh, insuring now? Lack of government support was also another challenge. Definitely, the CIS is here. If Isias can also answer that one, why, why is that? And uh, there is no, there should be a smart premium subsidy. If you can also explain that further, what, uh, what do we mean by that? Thank you. And so Sudan, what should we do as IGAT and uh, the regional body in order to push the Sudanese, South Sudanese government? to take appropriate steps in terms of adapting these risk transfer measures. What do you think we should do? What's your advice? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation of the all uh, member states. Uh, just I would like to add uh, Somalia presentation, especially in terms of policies and regulations developed. So, uh, Minister of Livestock in Somalia developed uh, able insurance policy, and it is uh, in a draft stage and waiting for endorsement. Also, Ministry of uh, Finance, there is a yeah, Somalia Insurance Bill Act that uh, developed in 2022. And this is especially focusing on the regulation and the supervision of the conventional insurance and the takeoff business in Somalia. There is also uh, a general insurance bolus would also in a draft stage. That is the uh, policies and the uh, regulations that already put in place uh, for Somalia government. Uh, I also would like to mention that uh, Bahnana, which is a uh, safety net program that implementing Somalia and uh, targeting 1.2 million as a, a cash transfer for uh, 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 response of the uh, shocks. Uh, besides that, I would like to ask one question for Ethiopian uh, colleagues, uh, especially on the crop insurance. They talked about that the premium collected uh, around uh, 10 million, but the payout is too uh, million. So 
it is good and a positive impact, but the question is that uh, the significant difference between the collected premium and uh, a payout is that uh, there is significant differences. So uh, does mean that there is no any showcase or climate uh, 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 showcase uh, so people uh, do not need to pay out? or is the project is new and uh, started recently? What is the uh, secret behind of that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for all the presentations. I think I have learned a lot. Uh, my particular interest is a presentation from my neighbor Kenya because it was very interesting I would like to learn more about the subsidy on how they are uh, subsidizing because I see I noted they were subsidizing from 0 0.5 acres to 20 acres 50 percent and then the uh, the light the after that I, I don't know maybe nothing uh, I'd like to know how that one was uh, calculated, how how it was arrived at, because the 0 0.5 and 20 acres, uh, the range is big. Uh, okay, and I think for the livestock, it may be a different story, because uh, somebody can uh, have very uh, very concentrated capital on a very small acreage for some intervention, for some livestock enterprises. Submit, thank you.